Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Gore Street Energy Storage Fund PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet company platform. Platform. Uh, before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll, which will just appear on your screens now. Um, and I would now like to hand you over to the management team from the Gore Street Energy Storage Fund PLC. Alex, good morning, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, um, I'm joined here by uh, four of my colleagues, uh, John, the principal in our investment team, Alicia, principal on the technical side, and Ben in our investor relations group. And I'm Alex O'Canada, the CEO and founder of Gore Street. Next slide, please. Um, we're very happy to present these results. Uh, we're very pleased with these results. There's some really key metrics I want to draw out as we go through this presentation. Um, kind of overall financial highlights, uh, total capacity of the portfolio, 1.2 gigawatts. Operational capacity, just under 300 megawatts, but post period that increased to 371 megawatts with the energization and operation of Stony. Uh, NAV total return, 0.7%. Uh, operational EBITDA 12.2 million. We'll talk about that in a while. But over, but the last quarter we are engaged in, we went dividend uh, cover positive uh, on the basis of no new capacity. So that's a very interesting uh, metric, which we'll talk more about. NAV per share just under 113. Um, it's a slight decrease from the last uh, NAV, driven wholly by a change in the discount rate and short-term inflation numbers. Uh, and we'll talk about that on the NAV bridge. Next slide, please. So, operational highlights. 19.3 uh, million of revenue during the period, 12.2 million of operational EBITDA. Um, GB revenue, and let's think about the pounds per megawatt hour as a, as a key metric for us to understand performance here. Our GB revenue, England, Scotland, Wales, uh, was seven pounds 50 per megawatt. Our non-GB revenue, just under £20 per megawatt per hour. Uh, so our non-GB portfolio is really outperforming uh, the GB market. Um, as uh, investors who've been with us for a while would have heard us talk about the value of diversification uh, on uh, again and again, um, we're operating in five different energy systems. They're all uncorrelated in terms of revenue. They're correlated in terms of investment thesis. So the same investment thesis supports our activities in California, Texas, Germany, Ireland, and GB. Uh, but that diversification gives a very strong level of lowering volatility in our revenue, but it's also given us this materially higher revenue than we would have been, been GB only. Um, so operational dividend cover of 1.15x of operational EBITDA of 8.3 million. It's a very strong result there, uh, turning uh, dividend cover positive on the basis of no new operational capacity. So just driven by very strong revenue performance, particularly in Ireland and Texas. 79.9 uh, megawatt stony asset, energized during reporting period. Um, big asset coming on stream for us, part of bringing on over 800 megawatts uh, by in the next 11 months. Um, so really step change in the operational capacity of the portfolio going from this 371 uh, with Stony to 820 over 11 months. Uh, we are engaged in a quite a complex revenue uh, pattern. Uh, we have about 20 different ways of making money across our portfolio. And Gore Street's manager is actively involved in optimizing those revenue sources to give us this very high level of uh, profitability. Um, we have a very strong balance sheet. Uh, 75 million of cash or near-term cash, uh, de minimis amount of debt uh, as we have been very conservative as we look at the headline rates on debt. Uh, debt level will increase through the course of 2024, but still remain uh, at a very low level as a percentage of GAAP. Next slide, please. John. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, so this page, um, <clears throat> we outline the NAV bridge for the six month period um, from um, 1st of April to 30th of September. Um, this really reflects, as Alex mentioned, the macro changes in, in discount rates and inflation, which together had a four pence uh, negative impact on NAV um, as we increased the discount rates by 25 basis points across the board for all assets at all stages, whether pre-construction, construction or operational. Um, so going through each of the items in turn, 
uh, funded some Jiji Holco operating expenses uh, are in line with kind of historical and as expected. Um, on dividends, uh, this 3.5 pence reflects the, the 2 pence paid in the June end quarter and the 1.5 pence paid in the September end quarter. Cash generation is 12.2 million EBITDA plus interest income of around 1.8 million, which is interest on the cash held uh, on account. On OPEX, we announced uh, at June end some internalization of certain asset management and o and contracts, particularly within GB and Ireland, uh, as well as some updated assumptions on the fleet-wide insurance policies, which we have, have started to initiate across the board. So that internalization of some of those core functions, which um, you know, we've been able to leverage through our in-house asset management team has been something we've been focused on. In terms of de-risking of uh, assets, these largely include um, Stony and Fermio assets, the two large uh, GB assets, which are either just been energized or to be energized imminently. Um, so for Stony, there was a 25 basis point reduction reflecting that movement into energization. And for Fermio, we reduced uh, the discount rate by 50 basis points, which was uh, again, a result of real um, de-risking through the construction process to a point now where the asset from our side is effectively built. And we're just waiting for the uh, DNO to provide um, the connection on their side. Just to note that these are still offset with that 25 basis point increase in additional discount rate hike. So Stony, uh, for example, given it was offset, 25 basis points remains at the same discount rate, taking those two effects into account. On revenue curves, um, as for all orders to quarters, um, the curves were updated. Um, in the context of the four grids in which we have operational assets, um, in GB, um, the curves dropped. Uh, and in Aircourt, they also kind of fell slightly, uh, but um, this was kind of you know, offset by increases in both the Irish curves and also California. Um, it's probably worth reiterating from our side, the effective um, kind of the impact of GB suppressed pricing and falling curves has not been so large um, on our side due to kind of what we anticipate as appropriate forecasting in, in previous, previous periods. So that those kind of reduced curves, we did not roll back as much as potentially some of our competitors have done. Um, and then in terms of other DCF changes, um, these include updated repowering assumptions, the releases of certain contingencies throughout the construction process, the effective asset rollover, um, updated commissioning dates for some of the GB assets like Fermure, and then also just some updated CapEx assumptions, which we have, um, you know, as we've gone through the uh, procurement process, uh, we have updated pricing on some of our assets which are about to enter construction. Um, so I, I think just the kind of the takeaway from this slide really is uh, we put it down in the in the bottom left hand side, the macro assumptions were the largest um, driver of the, the net decline. So if you if you took a scenario excluding kind of the the effects of inflation uh, and also discount rate, um, you would see uh, a net per share of one hundred sixteen point nine pence. So this slide um, we just outlined the curves um, which we've used across the portfolio. Um, on, a, on the merchant basis, so excluding the impact of any um, capacity market contracts in, in those markets where we do have them. Um, as you'll see, you know, it, as kind of indicated earlier, you know, the GB curve um, did see a decrease compared to kind of our FY23 assumptions as of March end. That reflects the current drop in, in you know, market prices and really is more of a near term decrease compared to what we previously forecast. In the longer term, I think we, we, you know, we, we believe kind of that the, the Pricing, which um, kind of we, we previously forecast, we, we will hit, and it's kind of the, I guess the, the run rate pricing in GB is kind of what we've seen and what we expect to move forwards. Um, in Ireland, um, the, the curve saw an uplift compared to what we previously seen. Um, I think it's particularly worth noting in this in this period, and at least you will kind of I think go into more detail later on. But in this period, um, yeah, in the Irish market, it is really expected to be seasonal, where the summer you would typically expect kind of lower. Um, wind penetration, which feeds into the DS3 scaler. But in, over this period, um, there was actually there was kind of quite a uh, number of storms uh, and high wind in Ireland. So the prices uh, over the summer months were actually elevated to, to those similar to what we see in, in winter. Uh, and that's uh, either fed through to the updated curves. Uh, and we've also seen in Ireland some delayed um, grid connection for new batteries coming online, which means I guess the, the, the expected saturation and penetration of new batteries will not be seen. So that's led to an increase in the curves there. In um, the US, um, both curves in uh, California and Texas remained closely in line with what we previously uh, assumed in terms of assumption. So there was no great change.
So on this uh, slide, we've just provided some additional uh, context on the assumptions used on both um, the OPEX and CAPEX uh, sides, as we mentioned earlier. Um, within the manager itself, the technical team has grown um, and given additional experience and expertise. Um, certain aspects have been internalized. So as I mentioned earlier, largely relating to asset management and O&M um, services, which we previously outsourced. Many of those will be able to kind of insource now um, within within the uh, portfolio fleet, um, such as you know fleet-wide insurance assumptions um, ac across the portfolio. Um, again, um, on the uh, during the period within ERCOT, the Texas market, we switched up, we switched our route to market provider um, to Tanasco, which is a more sophisticated optimizer. Um, and in the period, we were able to qualify those assets into the more lucrative ECRS service, which we benefited from, particularly in the, the later quarter um, to September end. Uh, and that really was able to kind of capitalize on kind of those, those uh, higher revenues in those summer months. On the CapEx side, we've also updated um, repowering assumptions based on slightly higher battery price increases, um, which for the forward curves, which we always price into one now. So the assumed um, repowering of uh, of the of the, the projects of the batteries when they hit a certain level of threshold um, capacity compared to nameplate capacity. However, as as you may be aware, the majority of our um, services have been in ancillary services across the fleet, so that is typically lower levels of cycling. So have significant remaining useful life beyond you know before repowering is required in general. Um, and for some other assets going into the construction phase, we've updated CapEx costs and estimates for EPC and balance of plant, balance of plant items. Um, and that really just reflects the latest contractual discussions and estimates which we've been discussing with our, with our contractors. Uh, on the right hand side, as you'll see from inflation and discount rates, um, we've seen a decrease in inflation assumptions based on uh, the updated macro view as of September, September end. Uh, and as indicated earlier, we, we've included a 25 basis point increase in discount rates across the board for all the assets. And you see there the breakdown as we kind of de-risk through the process for um, the uh, pre-construction phase, kind of we discount assets at um, kind of 10 half to 11% down through into the into the kind of energized phase um, for contracted down to kind of seven to, to seven and a quarter to nine and a quarter percent. And the uncontracted income, which is the majority majority of um, our kind of cash flows, we assume around eight point seven five to nine point two five percent. Just just to kind of reiterate, all of the end services um, and trading, uh, which constitutes a large portion of our uh, revenues across all different grids, we we um, categorise as uh, uncontracted revenues. And then at the bottom, um, you see uh, sensitivities. Um, so. Um, they show the impacts of some of the key inputs for which we generally update uh, in order periods on a, and this is shown on a pence per share basis within NAV, uh, with inflation and discount rates having the the largest impact as you'll see. Uh, we believe these are appropriate measures, and we have the you know in terms of disclosure, um, you know we have we have high levels of disclosure kind of amongst our peers uh, on those two aspects. Next slide, please, Ben. Thank you. Um, so on this slide, you can see uh, the benefits, I think, of international diversification. Um, as Alex indicated, the fund achieved operational EBITDA during the period of 12.2 million uh, and fund EBITDA of 8.5 million, um, which resulted in a dividend cover of 0.72 operational and um, 0.5 for the fund over the six months. Again, you know, over the kind of late quarter, we achieved operational dividend cover of 1.15 times uh, and also we're over one times on a kind of fund EBITDA basis. Um, when you kind of look at the um, GB market itself, whilst that's, you know, being um, experienced suppressed pricing over the period, you see on the on the right hand side, the breakdown of EBITDA uh, by grid is actually quite stark. So, for example, ERCOT, for which we have 30 megawatts in operation, contributes 28% of EBITDA compared to 9% um, for GB, which for which in this period we had 110 megawatts. Um, and uh, this is all on the basis of the 291 megawatts in, in operation. Um, obviously, we've now energized Stony, which is an additional 80 megawatts. Um, and as we will show in slides later on, um, you know, we, we will have more than 800 megawatts in operation by the end of 2024. So in the absence of any additional fundraisers, um, this will be on the same basis of dividend denominator. Um, so 
that that is the kind of basis of you know as as we kind of the money the cash that we've raised previously that is used to fully fund the build out of this additional um this, this additional pipeline which is going to be uh, online by the end of 2024. So just a snapshot of uh, the update of operational portfolio across uh, across all geographies and across the fund. Uh, so the notable change that has already been touched upon is Estony, so 80 megawatts that we energized uh, in August. Um, it's located near Milton Keynes in England. Um, that asset is now out of the reporting period, has been made uh, operational and is actually trading um as of december it's a very positive uh milestone achieved for 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 80 megawatts uh in, in gb so gb now constitutes 51 percent of the portfolio um and uh the combined assets in republic of ireland and northern ireland are 35 percent with texas uh just just below 10 and and, and germany germany six six percent so that creates uh that diversification that we'll be uh touching upon uh, over the next uh, next slides, um, next slide, please. Um, so, touch upon the revenues uh, and uh, and how they have been um, realizing themselves over the past two quarters, um, and particularly with some focus on on September end and that that's that spike that you can see on the on this on this graph. Um, so revenues across our portfolio are seasonally hedged. Um, that is a result of uh, sort of strong winter and summer variations in, in the fleet performance across the portfolio. Um, so generally the trends that we expect to see, the predictable trends is that Irish assets uh, that operate in the uncapped regime uh, should be seeing a, a relative um, stronger performance in winter. Um, so winter generally uh, indicates a higher wind penetration. Revenues in DS3 uncapped in Ireland are um, uh, monetized by skillers that um, are highly focused on the satisfaction of uh, electricity demand by the relative renewable energy generation. If that generation is higher, such as in winter, and if the buildup of renewables also increases, then uh, the, the revenues generally are uh, increasing, and that's what we're seeing in uh, in winter. This summer has been slightly um, different. We actually have seen high levels of wind, particularly in July and August, and that that has uh, driven um, above uh, base case performance for in that season for the Irish assets in in uncapped regime. Um, ERCOT assets in Texas have behaved as expected in terms of very strong performance in summer. Um, they have definitely exceeded some of the expectations, uh, particularly in August. Uh, our Texas assets have generated uh, around 150 pounds per megawatt per hour, um, which, as you would have seen from other slides, and, and, and in comparison, order of magnitude higher than, uh, for example, fleeting uh, uh, in GB. That is really driven by um, scarcity of generation occurring in summer with high uh, temperatures uh, in, in ERCOT, where effectively some of the older uh, thermal fleet in ERCOT is, is unable to operate in those high temperatures. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a very um, uh, interesting, interesting way of illustrating effectively what happens to variation of uh, revenues across um, quite a long historical period that you can see on the x as uh, axis um, when diversification is added to the to the portfolio. So, looking at average. Um, uh, revenues across GB and then deriving uh, standard deviation from, from, from this historical period that you can see. Um, visually, you can see a, a large variation of revenues across different uh, quarters and the standard deviation was around five pounds per megawatt. Uh, and that uh, then has quite significantly changed when um, our portfolio has uh, had seen the addition of assets in Ireland, assets in Texas and assets in Germany. That one standard deviation has now reduced to 2.7, so it has nearly halved the variance. And also um, 
the addition of addition of of other um, of other uh, jurisdictions have also increased uh, has increased the overall average of revenues. Those revenues are highly uh, uncorrelated across geographies, um, so uh, we don't expect any uh, uh, any more global movements in terms of impact from uh, from from seasonality to to change, and that uh, natural hedge should should remain in place. Next slide, please. Uh, so just a overall um, uh, summary of how we think about stacking revenues uh, for, for the portfolio. So our batteries um, very much focus on um, being able to capture revenues, new revenue streams in the markets we already exist in, but also being able to very quickly uh, step into new markets and, and, and take advantage of being a first mover. Um, in uh, in terms of ancillary services where we provide uh, frequency um, and power quality support to system operators, uh, we um, effectively capture, capture across all our ge geographies around 15 different services. Um, so that does require technical um, expertise in being able to uh, pre-qualify and, and continue to uh, meet performance requirements. In most markets, there are stringent performance requirements for those ancillary services and um, there are penalties if those uh, performance measures are not, um, not met. Uh, however, it does mean that a good operator with an experienced asset management team is able to capitalize on that strong uh, technical track record. Uh, in terms of trading, um, we effectively now access trading in um, all our markets in which we have assets, definitely in GB. Uh, that's a big part of the portfolio strategy. Um, obviously, when the opportunity arises, uh, we have now started trading also across Ireland. Uh, we are trading in Germany and um, we have trading capability. And when it's appropriate, we do access that in in, in ERCOT. Last but not least, capacity market contracts, um, generally long-term contracts, which allow system operators to secure capacity with a very predictable long-term uh, timeline, usually around 10 to, to 15 years. Uh, notably, um, we will be speaking more about the resource adequacy contracts that we will be um, capturing with our Big Rock uh, project in, in California, that's a very uh, important part of the overall uh, revenue stack for that asset and for that geography. If we can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so just a, a recap of all the revenue strategy, strategies across uh, different, uh, different grids. Ireland uh, very much still focus on the DS3 uh, services. It's, it's, uh, it's a strong performance market with relatively slow accession rate for, uh, for batteries due to generate grid delays. Um, the budget has now been confirmed for the next year as not being changed and the rates have not been changed. We don't expect them to change in January. This is very positive news uh, overall for that market. It's, it is driven by generally much slower pace of build out than was anticipated by um, by air grid and generally also by um, uh, overall kind of lesser budget consumption than, than they predicted. Um, we have been also accessing trading uh, in this market and testing out uh, smaller amounts of uh, volume to see whether there's an upside and we have been able to generate significant upside as you can see from the slide. Um, it's not a linear, um, it's not a linear uh, type of uh, behavior uh, that ups upside is uh, limited to uh, only effectively opportunities where uh, and, and time uh, windows where DS3 is um, if, is of a lesser value. So it's it's not that you release the whole battery capacity, that it's a multiplier of what we have captured there. Um, in ERCOT, um, effectively really strong performance was driven by ancillary services. Um, that is the outcome of ERCOT releasing a new service, ECRS, which they have released uh, really off the back of um, trying to reinforce uh, the transmission system and generate an electricity market that have seen volatility and obviously various storms and very negative uh, events in the past few years over winter, especially. Um, so we expect that ERCOT will continue to build out additional fleet of tools to be able to uh, mitigate against any further um, uh, 
events like Yuri Storm, for example, from a from, uh, couple of years ago. Um, we expect to continue to capture those ancillary services and that to be majority of the stack. Um, however, when opportunity comes, our assets are uh, positioned and able to capture trading uh, uh, trading revenues when, when that uh, becomes a more um, optimized strategy. Uh, NGB really focusing on um, being able to access all portfolio of revenues. Uh, this is going to be particularly important as we don't expect that uh, saturation in the DSTAR services should change. Um, however, there is a number of other policy movements and market mechanism movements like the open balancing platform that should be changing the, the revenue stack and still to be seen um, how it will, in what extent it's going to affect the revenue stack, but we expect it will definitely have a positive upside uh, impact on, on the results in uh, GB. And Germany, uh, a market where we have, uh, with a new um, partner, new route to market part partner inspired, we have access now uh, a large um, depth of short-term trading, uh, algorithmic trading. Uh, this is always asset-backed, but allows us to uh, take a near-term positions and um, churn effectively uh, trades. Uh, and, and that has resulted in, in a very large uh, share of trading, 64% in, in, uh, in terms of the stock. Um, it's, it's a very positive uh, outcome. Again, if we were just focused on ancillary services, we would have seen uh, a significant, probably around 20% lower uh, revenue performance uh, in, in that market. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Um, quite a complex picture. Uh, we're engaged in multiple types of revenue activities in individual markets. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile then bringing you back to actually what does that mean? You know, follow the cash. How are we actually doing in terms of revenue per grid? Uh, and I think it's really interesting. You look at this uh, breakdown, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, Ireland is one energy system. Uh, we're averaging uh, for this period uh, just over £17 per megawatt for every hour we're in operation. Uh, it's a really significant uh, result. Uh, as Alicia said, we expected actually this summer in Ireland uh, to be making less than that, given that we're tied to the level of wind generation across the island, and there's more wind generation in winter, obviously. But uh, very strong wind penetration, very strong winds, leading to good wind generation, and therefore leading to our assets. Uh, we're, carrying out a very valuable service to keep the grid stabilized and therefore accruing significant revenue. In Britain, uh, at £7.50 uh, per megawatt per hour in operation, um, we're tracking the market. I think any energy storage player in GB is kind of plus or minus 5%. Uh, we're, we're kind of engaged in, in similar strategies. Um, this is a, a reasonable uh, uh, number. Uh, you might recall, obviously, during 20 and 21, uh, sorry, 21, 22, uh, GB was a very profitable market. Uh, we at the time were wrong on the upside. We thought it would be less revenue. Uh, so these numbers we're seeing here uh, in 2023 are on trend for our projections. Uh, Germany, uh, just under nine pounds per megawatt. Uh, we expect to see some pickup in this as we go into the winter months. Uh, but then again, uh, this is on base case. Aircot, the Texas market, obviously a standout performer, uh, 40 pounds per megawatt. Uh, per hour, uh, put it into context, you know, uh, we have 30 megawatts in operation in, uh, in, uh, in Aircot in, in Texas, uh, we would have had to have, um, you know, nearly 150 megawatts in operation in GB for a similar level of revenue. Uh, so really strong set of uh, return on investment, for sure, given how much money we were making for the individual assets, but uh, characteristic by high temperatures in the summer, aging gas infrastructure, not able to cope with those high temperatures and a high electricity demand. Overall then, uh, 15 pounds, just over 15 pounds per megawatt for every hour in operation, uh, portfolio weighted average, really strong results, um, you know, uh, over uh, nearly 2x what we would be making if we were GB only. Uh, so diversification is not only smoothing out the revenue volatility, uh, from individual markets is also delivering to us an absolute higher level of reven revenue. If I look across our peer groups, we'll be making the absolute highest level of revenue, uh, not just on a per megawatt basis, but absolute numbers as well as EBITDA. Uh, next slide, please. 
Great. So this slide um, illustrates the portfolio build out capacity uh, over time as we move forwards, um, as we expect to energize um, significant projects throughout 2024 to reach more than 800 megawatts by the end of um, next year. So as you see, the, the, the first, we've got 371.5 megawatts total in operation at the moment, which includes that Stony asset, which was energized uh, recently. Um, Ferry Muir uh, is the next GB asset, which we expect to come online uh, in January next year. We're, we've done all the work on our side in terms of construction. We're actually waiting for the, the counterpart DNO uh, to finish their works and actually connect the system. Um, and then the 57 megawatt Enderby um, project again in GB scheduled to be energized in June next year. Moving into international markets, so PBSL2 is the extension of the Port of Town project in the Republic of Ireland. Um, 60 megawatts there. Um, we expect that to be uh, in operation by June next year. Um, and then the two larger um, US projects, so Big Rock, which is the California project. Um, we acquired the project right to that in, in March uh, this year. Um, we already acquired the batteries and now we're in the process of kicking off the kind of balance upon EPC uh, and getting that project uh, into construction uh, with a with a target energization date of December 24. And again, Dogfish, another project which we acquired the project rights for in January this year. Uh, we're just kicking off the EPC process, uh, sorry, the construction process now, um, having you know looked looked at EPC um, pro, um, procurement options, uh, and again expect that to be uh, fully commissioned by the end of next year. So if you look at the total um, 830 megawatts by the end of next by the end of 2024. That is all funded through existing cash reserves and or you know, available debt, which we have. As Alex mentioned, we're yet to draw on um, those debt facilities in any meaningful way. But we did announce the um, $60 million uh, project financing at Big Rock, which we will be drawing on uh, for that project. Uh, and then, you know, as, as, as we need to draw uh, on additional funds as, we, as the um, remaining uh, cash uh, we seek to build out these projects is drawn down, um, we will do so. So up until... Um, the end of 2024, all these projects are fully funded from existing resources. Beyond that, we have projects again in 2025 in Texas, which they're the Dallas and Surrounds um, phase two projects. Uh, and then beyond that, we have additional uh, projects in Middleton, which is the 2026 COD um, project in GB, and then 19 megawatts in addition in, uh, in Ireland, which we will uh, look to commission. And we do have you know, the option to look at uh, the uh, to extend the accordion within our existing facility to, to fund these build outs and also kind of as alluded to in the uh, interim report this morning you know potentially looking to recycle capital through um the kind of existing portfolio which we can use to invest into potentially more attractive higher growth markets if we look at the the bottom um graphs and, and slides we see the split by geography um in terms of portfolio that is on a megawatt basis but if you if you took it on a megawatt hour basis whereby we have longer duration systems in in aircot and kaiso which um you know satisfy the actual market construct in in, in those areas that split would be kind of ne nearer on a per megawatt hour basis kind of nearer 50 percent across the us um moving across to the kind of system duration itself you, you'll you'll see that split we do retain optionality across um all of our well it, across our systems to be able to increase um, the duration as and when uh, the mock opportunity presents itself. At the moment, as you know, you heard from Alicia, largely in GB, that's been dominated by ancillary to date. It does not require longer duration systems, um, but at the appropriate time when there is the trading opportunity, you know, we, we may seek to expand um, duration in, in GB assets. And um, we future proofed, you know, in terms of the projects we've acquired, we, we try to future proof those in order to, to make those extensions as and when required. And then split by stage on the on the right hand side, you'll see that now kind of around one quarter operational. By the end of 2024, that will flip such that uh, three quarters um, will be an operation of the total portfolio. Yeah, I think um, just uh, just just a few comments on that, right? So really interesting tipping point here. 371 megawatts today, 11 months, which is not a long time in the world of infrastructure, assets in construction funded 
uh, progressing well. Ferry is disappointing. The asset is built and we're waiting for Scottish Power, but we are in active conversations with them on a near daily basis uh, to hold this uh, January uh, timing that they've given us. Uh, but, you know, really strong set of portfolio assets coming on stream here over the course of 2024, including, of course, our big rock asset in, in California, a, a really important asset to the overall portfolio. So a step change in the portfolio makeup but continue to build out our diversification, but continue to build out to a really strong level of operational portfolio. Ben. On this slide, um, we're giving a high level view of the, um, the frameworks which we use to record and report the company's ESG performance. Uh, in the center there, you'll see SFDR. This is a European framework which the company adopted back in 2022. Uh, the framework is looking at uh, the framework is aiming at reducing greenwashing and improving transparency to investors. So that's a uh, framework we voluntarily adopted, and you'll see uh, reporting for that included in the company's annual report and included in the company's um, ESG report, which comes out on an annual basis. Uh, TCFD in the top left, that is a UK framework which looks at climate related uh, opportunities and risks. Uh, an interesting framework which is is quite f uh, forward looking. It explores different uh, scenarios. Um, and how that could affect the company um, and its uh, operations. PRI on the top right, uh, that's a new framework for the company. Um, as its name indicates, looks at um, responsible investing uh, and the company completed its first um, filing for that uh, during the reporting period, so uh, in September uh, 2023. Uh, on the left-hand side, the, uh, the, the metrics there, they are the key um, sustainably in, in the key sustainable sustainability indicator metrics uh, which the fund has chosen three and a half thousand tons of co2 avoided and um, that's during the uh, previous fiscal year and that's based off a operational portfolio of 291 megawatts as the portfolio grows we will expect um, those uh, sustainability metrics to increase as well and uh, bottom left hand corner fair cobalt alliance and um, this is uh, this is an interesting organization that the company again joined during the reporting periods uh, and is part of our engagement along the supply chain, along the company supply chain. Although uh, GSF doesn't um, directly source cobalt, uh, its uh, suppliers obviously do, uh, and joining this initiative, um, working to improve conditions in the mines and uh, working with the local communities uh, where the uh, complex minerals are sourced. Um, thank you. So in conclusion, uh, we have a strong portfolio in construction, uh, which uh, we're, we're very happy with the progress. Um, of course, the grid operators remain under pressure in terms of switching on, not just energy storage assets, but solar, wind, data centers, uh, housing estates, hospitals. So we, we appreciate the difficulties they have, but we are working very closely with them around holding to uh, the dates in our uh, projections. Uh, but a step change in the operational portfolio from 371 to 820 over the next 11 months. Uh, we believe we are the cost leader in terms of megawatts fully installed. Um, uh, when we look at published data, uh, our, our assets seem to be at the at the, the right level in terms of cost. We have our own internal procurement group, uh, which is active in the market with a range of different suppliers to maintain that cost advantage that we bring to our projects. And of course, we have the best in class revenue generation um, uh, against the GB only strategy. We're making 2x the revenue that we would have. Um, we're well positioned in five very important markets, GB, Ireland, Germany, Texas and California. And uh, we, we believe that revenue generation maximization will continue as we look out into 2024. Overall, the firm continues to deliver against its targets. Uh, we continue to build out the portfolio, we continue to optimize the revenue opportunity in our portfolio, and we're engaged across the entire value chain to deliver value to our investors. Um, I think we have time now for some questions which came through. Perfect. Uh, Alex, John, Alicia, Ben, if I may just jump back in there. And thank you very much indeed for your presentation this morning. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. And um, Ben, obviously, we did receive a number of pre-submitted questions uh, ahead of today's event. And as you can see there in the Q&A tab, we've also received a number of questions throughout your presentation this morning as well. Um, so firstly, thank you to all of those on the call for taking the time to submit their questions. And Ben, if I may hand over to you now just to chair the Q&A session with the team, and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Thank you.
Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, so the first question we've had in uh, would be, you have done well minimising gearing expenses. What is the policy going forward and do you have a facility in place? Yep, I said that. So, um, yeah, as kind of we alluded to in the earlier slides, we this year we've um, upsized our kind of RCF at the corporate level, um, which has gone from 25 million up to 50 million facility. That remains undrawn uh, as it stands, um, but we've added that additional flexibility to be able to, to use um, as, as we move forwards. Um, should, should the, should the, um, the, the pricing and the opportunity present itself uh, from a build up perspective. We also added the project level financing at Big Rock. So that's a $60 million um, US facility. Um, that can be drawn for um, the purpose of building and constructing um, the California asset itself. And we will see to draw that down as we progress through the, through the construction um, uh, process over the next 12 months. Now, in terms of taking those two together, if they were all fully drawn, um, that would constitute around 99 to 100 million of uh, fully drawn debt on a, on a sterling basis, which is effectively around 15% of GAV, which is still a relatively conservative level when we look at uh, kind of uh, leverage levels ac across the board. Um, we do have, as mentioned, the opportunity to um, exercise an accord on our, on our kind of um, RCF basis uh, up to a maximum of 30% of GAV, um, should we choose to, to be able to potentially fund those projects beyond 2024. Um, but obviously we'll, we'll assess that in the context of, you know, capital optimization uh, as we move through 2024, um, you know, that, um, you know, could involve, as we mentioned, some capital recycling across some of our projects to reinvest in other, in other markets. Um, so obviously given prevailing, um, pricing and debt, uh, debt costs, um, we, we do. We are cognizant of those, um, but we believe in you know a conservative level of gearing going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question um, is around geographical split. So, uh, what is the geographical split of the portfolio, and would you consider reallocation of capital to higher profitability markets such as the US? Yeah, uh, so uh, we have an investment policy, 40% of the portfolio needs to be GB in Ireland, and we're obviously well over that, so that's, uh, that's the, the kind of line, 60% then rest of the world, which is mainland Europe uh, and America for us at this point. Um, for sure, uh, we are in a very good position in that we're active in the five different energy systems, so we can turn on or turn off capital allocation to each of those different jurisdictions, you know, as, as we want. Uh, we are in the business of delivering returns to our investors. So if we saw good prices for assets in, for instance, GB, and we wanted to recycle that capital into the Irish market or the California market or the Airquad market, uh, we would absolutely do that. So uh, we're, that is that kind of portfolio optimization is an activity that we're consistently engaged in. Thank you very much. Uh, the next one, um, Please explain hourly income in a simple way. Is it 12 hours or 24 hours? And does it include weekends? Um, so generally, the, 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 the revenues really are um, optimized across a 24 hour window. We um, don't really have uh, markets in which we operate with long term um, with long term um, hedges or, or, or uh, forwards. So generally, um, the way the way we think about optimization, the way our partners also execute optimization, is that um, predictions are being made about day ahead spreads, and that sets out the opportunity cost of bidding for ancillary services uh, in most markets. Um, generally, on the day ahead markets, you also uh, procure ancillary services. It's uh, set up in that way. For example, in Ercot, it's set up in the way also in uh, Germany. Um, so effectively, our prediction and view about the spreads um, and allows us then to also realize ancillary services uh, prices. So generally, um, if we um, do not clear in, 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 a, in, a, in a wholesale market, then we would uh, effectively move to uh, to ancillary service that would have been uh, that would have been uh, secured as a as an as an alternative. Um, generally, over twenty four hour period, I would say that um, we hold state of charge at the position where 
um, batteries are ready to uh, deliver ancillary services. So it, it could be changing across 24 hours, depending on uh, the, the level of energy throughput that the service requires. Um, but throughout the day, uh, we would uh, generally slowly um, manage that state of charge and top up. So generally, you know, we don't execute a strategy where we charge up where the prices are low during the night and discharge during the during the day in high prices, because that would effectively mean that the battery is not being utilized in between those two uh, uh, arbitrage events. We would generally um, manage state of charge slowly in ancillary services during the day and then discharge uh, in the high uh, peak hours. That's that's probably a kind of a simplified view of a 24 hours between the between those uh, between those day and night uh, positions or day and night um, relative prices. We would um, always have ancillary services uh, provided in between, so that batteries are never uh, really sitting idle. Yeah, I mean, I think another thank you, Lisa. Another way to think about that is the whether we're discharging or not discharging. It depends on what the service we're in, right? So the number on the ORNS saying uh, how much we're making hourly income, that is for every hour in that quarter. That's the average revenue we have in that quarter. Uh, but how the, the, the battery is operated across that quarter depends on different types of services. So um, in grid balancing, our assets are 50% full of electricity, so they can be a consumer or generator, and the grid operator will ping our assets uh, second by second, to be honest. Um, for which we will charge them an hourly rate for the length of the contract. Um, so overall, the number you see here in the ORNS about how many hours, uh, what our average revenue per hour is, that is the amount of hours available in that quarter. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more question here on um, uh, on for commercial. Um, so that is, as the market becomes more saturated, will trading become a greater component of income? How is the company adding to its strategy to tackle the effects of market saturation? Yeah, so I would say among our listed peers, we are carrying out the most level of trading. Uh, that is in the German market and the Irish market. We're very actively involved in uh, in wholesale trading. Not so much the GB market. That as yet is not a profitable market uh, for trading, though we are well set up to avail of trading revenues when and if that becomes available to us. But we're very active already trading in Ireland and in Germany and very successful for us. So um, an active manager against the wholesale trading markets and generating revenue right now. Thank you. Uh, this one, I think we uh, we did touch on uh, briefly in the presentation, but uh, last week, the ESO announced the launch of the opening balancing platform using bulk, bulk, bulk dispatch optimizer to enhance the use of energy storage in the balancing mechanism. Have you noticed any difference for the use of your assets um, and do you think this or other plan changes in 2024 will have a material impact on GSF? So <clears throat> it's been only two days. Uh, I, I must admit this is too short horizon to be kind of making uh, strong statements about uh, change to the revenue just yet. We know that, that there has been a material amount of instructions, about 2,500 instructions just in one day um as of uh as of the position as of 13th of december so um it, it has had a material impact of, of on number of uh effectively calls upon batteries um i would only say that this is material in that sense that it shows national grid commitment to um, lower the cost of balancing to consumers so batteries are inherently more efficient to dispatch. They are not like gas speakers that require to sit and run to be able to then be ramped up or run down. So I expect that the batteries will be called upon more and more now that um, it requires, it's much less manual as a dispatch. Um, it will really, really be dependent on um, the prevailing prices in the market and, and of course the number of uh, congestion that might uh, happen in, in the GB system that will require uh, local generation. But as fundamentally as renewable generation increases and we're not usually able to keep up with the pace of transmission build out to manage congestion, I do expect that batteries will play a, a big role in, in management of that congestion. Uh, through balancing and um, using batteries is just the natural, the most cheapest way to do it. And National Grid has a regulatory obligation to, to minimize the cost uh, to consumers. 
Thank you. Um, and one more on revenues in uh, GB. Uh, so what products are available to UK best assets to provide fixed revenues? Yeah, I mean, I'll quickly take that. Um, it's always been available, the capacity market contract, right? So that is about between 10 and 15 percent of revenue. And um, for all of our assets, we have the, those uh, multi-year long-term contracts and uh, index linked. So um, that always exists. There is also other products coming into market where we could partner with utilities to give a fixed rate return over our assets for a period of time. So there is, you know, a more there's more maturity in the market construct, which uh, I think Gore Street's always been at the leading edge of this. Uh, we can see different ways of fixing being more variable. It's all about what the cost of fixing is versus the variable upside. And so we're examining that at all times. But the, the UK market, the GB market, UK market has always had a capacity market construct and we are successful in those contracts. Thank you. Uh, and one more would be uh, on the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, did GSF enter Texas and California um, due to the Inflation Reduction Act? Uh, and is there a possibility that this act could be uh, repealed next year? Yeah, I don't know if I'm qualified to uh, to quote on whether the act could be repealed next year. I think it would be very difficult to repeat. You have to go through Congress and need a filibuster, I believe. Um, so we don't view this as a very uh, very high risk um, in terms of uh, it being repealed, especially given when our assets are actually being, uh, coming into operation when we should receive uh, cash back under the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, that said, uh, you know we are expecting, you know you know tens of millions of dollars back uh, in terms of capex being switched on but it's not quite as simple as that if the inflation reduction act wasn't there less assets would get built and therefore our existing assets of the incumbent would generate more revenue because there would be a scarcity now that revenue would be over a longer period of time than the uh, than the cash influx in 2020 uh, for 2025 for instance uh, but you know, it's a complex picture, right? You're incentivizing market to build, right? So more assets are getting built to compete with our assets. And if you don't incentivize that ass that market, less assets get built, therefore our assets should accrue more revenue. Um, overall though, we uh, we hope and don't believe this is a high risk. Thank you. Um, take a few more. Uh, so one question here, you stated Stony was energized. Is it in commercial operations yet or just switched on and in testing? So I can confirm that Stony as of December is now trading. So it is in commercial operation. Great. Um, thank you very much. If I hand back over to Jake. Perfect. Ben, Alex, John, Alicia, thank you very much indeed for addressing all of those questions that, that came in from investors this morning. And of course, we will be able to give you back all of the questions that were submitted today, as well as any others that do come through um, immediately after the presentation has ended, uh, just for you to review to then add any additional responses, of course, where it's appropriate to do so. And we'll publish all those responses out on the platform. Um, but Alex, perhaps before really just looking to redirect those on the call to provide you their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself uh, and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with that would be great yeah uh, thank you um you know again we believe uh, a strong period a period that shows the value of diversification a, bit, a period that shows the value of tight control of the assets in terms of revenue optimization um for sure uh, energy storage remains this critical asset of our energy transition uh, and we can see that in all the markets that we're operating in um one of the components of energy storage though it is more or less a merchant asset class and therefore our ability to lower volatility versus having for instance a gb only strategy i think is very important and one should be able to see that now in these uh, figures it's the first quarter we turned yeah dividend cover positive so we're very uh, we're very pleased about that especially off the back of not actually operational capacity increase but on that basis we have a significant operational capacity increase over the next 11 months and we're very focused on bringing those assets on time and on budget and I want to thank all our investors again. Alex, that's great. And thank you once again for updating investors this morning. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can really better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Gore Street Energy Storage Fund PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good morning to you all.